When we hear the name Williamson, we instantly think respect when it comes to harness racing. Phil Williamson has a record second to none, particularly with the trotters. And his three sons, Nathan, Matthew and Brad, are cutting their teeth in this cutthroat sport. But Nathan Williamson is a guy we get to sit down with today. Talk to him about his training and driving career. He's going to be the next into the 1000 win club in terms of the driving. And he's really making a name for himself as a trainer based in Invercargill. Well, Nath, they say any day in Southland's a good day, and well, the sun's out. Yeah, it's slightly damp, but I suppose you get used to that. Yeah, no, things can get pretty damp through the winter, Greg, but um, yeah, no, the sun's out today, so we got all our work done, and we didn't get wet, so it was good. Let's talk about where this journey started, and Omaru, I'm not going to call it that other name that your father gets rather angry <laughs> when people try and pronounce it. Um, what, are, what are your earliest memories, particularly around the horses? Yeah, well, we just grew up on the farm. Dad lived, um, well, mum and dad, we lived right next door to um, mum's mother and father, and they had um, the farm with yeah, granddad trained horses, and um, yeah, just growing up around the horses, we were there. We lived pretty much at our grandparents' place um, as much time as we were at home, you know, so we were always around the horses, and dad was training and driving, and um, mum was um, driving at that stage too, and um, yeah, um, Nana and Grandad had had the horses there, so uh, no, we're always involved with horses right from the word go. That's that's a little known fact in the in the Williamson story, I suppose. Your involvement of your mum in terms of the the horses, but um, she was a bit of a pioneer in the area. Yeah, yeah, yeah did see it. Like she um, she used to drive um, at the workouts and trials. She never got a race day license, but she was always driving um, at the workouts and trials. She'd have as many drives as Dad, so. Um, yeah, so no, she was um, yeah pretty um, pretty accomplished at it, but obviously she had us kids to look after, and she never took it th that much further. But um, yeah, no, she was she was doing a bit of driving, so that no, was it was always uh, always always good, and we we're always at all the workouts and trials, and yeah. All right, big family, three boys, and your sister, Jasmine. Yep. 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 Yeah. You know. Um, yeah. No, we were just any just a normal family growing up. You know, just. Um, yeah, well, I suppose we still are, but you know what I mean? Like just getting out in, in the weekends and just around the horses. And we had ponies and doing all those sorts of things. And um, no, we all got on pretty well, so no, it was good. All right, you, Matthew and Brad. Was any annoyance as a, as a young fella as much as he is these days, Matthew? <laughs> How did you get on with him? What was the pecking order like, or was it because you were the oldest, you always held sway? Yeah, I probably, I probably did. No, Matty, Matty was very quiet back in there. He's making up for it Oof, now, but he's, he? he he was very quiet in those early days. He was he was really standoffish and shy. And um, yeah, he had a bit of a um, a bad accident there when he was growing up. And um, well, sort of when he was about, I think he was about twelve or thirteen. And um, yeah, he was sort of um, yeah, that set him back a little bit. But um, yeah, he's making up for it now. So tell us a little bit more about that. What 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 was involved? Oh, well, just, he was, we, we, um, one of Maddie's friends had a motorbike and of course they'd bring it around to our place because we had the track there, Dad, um, at Nana and Grandad's place, just, it was only a 600 metre dirt track, but it was, um, so we'd hoon out there with the motorbike and, um, this weekend, um, yeah, the, he was going around and had a bit of wet stuff and, um, yeah, he hurt himself quite badly. He was concussed and he was in, in a bad way there for a while and, um, yeah, sort of knocked him for a wee bit. I remember he was very, um, well, he was high up in his rugby, believe it or not. He yep. was only a little fella, but he was um, pretty tough. Doing, doing, yeah, yeah, he was doing really, really well. And that sort of, I think it knocked his confidence a little bit. He never sort of um, got back to the rugby too much after that. But um, yeah, and it, and it set him back a little bit um, as far as um, that was. But um, no, he's certainly making up for it all now. And uh, yeah, you wouldn't know it now. First good horse your dad had. What do you remember of role model? Yeah, well, he was just part of the family, really, Greg. Um, Dad wasn't training many horses. He was working night shift at the works at that stage, and um, he only had one paddock of horses. I think there was three or four horses out in the paddock, and um, he was the first horse Dad ever trained, but um, he honestly really was a member of the family. We used to, you know, get him in and do everything with him as far as, you know, we could do anything with him. He was that type of horse and feeding him carrots and brushing him and and used to ride him a little bit as well, just back in the day, there's a video at home of me riding him around, so 
um, yeah, he was um, a great family horse and turned out to be a great horse too, you know. Yeah, yeah look, he got a, a trotting championship. Well, I think it was a group two back then, but that must have been an incredibly special time for the family. And you were saying to me before, easy to remember your age because he was the same age. Yeah, that's right. We sort of grew up together, if you like. And uh, no, it was a sad day. Probably I remember, um, you know, he, he went to another stable and that was pretty upsetting. I remember the family, we were... We were pretty upset about it. Obviously, we didn't own him, so yep. it wasn't our call. And, and then, then he come back for a bit, and then he then he ended up um, finishing his racing career in Australia. But um, he was he was a great horse, and I suppose it's what becomes synonymous with um, you know Dad ending up having trotters, him being a converted pacer. Yeah, absolutely. What about school life? What was that like for you? Um, I loved primary school when we were growing up. We were just down the road from um, the school we were at, but. Um, yeah, I, high school wasn't really for me. Um, yeah, I just I wanted to get out and, and do the horse thing. I was sort of hooked on it by then, and it was ruling my life anyway. So um, when I was old enough, I packed my bags and we were out of there. All right, so did you start out working for Dad? Is that how it worked? Yeah, well, I had a couple of um, stints at different trainers' places um, in school holidays. Just um, when I went for Bruce Negus one winter, and, and that was really, really good. And it just sort of probably ignited the fire that I definitely wanted to do it and then um, yeah I started off dad had just finished up at the works and it sort of coincided that I'd you know start working for him and um, yeah the, the ball really started rolling he ended up we had such a strong team then and then it just sort of built from there so yeah just went straight working for dad and um, no the rest is history as they say. Yeah let's talk about some of those horses and one that springs to mind is Allegra Agitato and what a job what an outstanding racehorse. Yeah, no, she was a great mare. Um, I remember her arriving actually and um, she'd had another trainer before and um, they said she had a, a ton of ability but she was um, pretty difficult and she definitely was difficult in those earlier days but um, I think she just liked the, the style of training that Dad sort of had um, in those days and, and she just sort of... Um, you know, settled into the routine and um, got better and better. And yeah, her talent was um, immense. And yeah, she did a super job. Yeah, not only the trotters that you had at the time, but the female trotters. One over Kenny arrived and won the Oaks and obviously went on and won a couple of road cups. One for your dad and, and, and one for the great Tony Hooley as well. Um, and Jasmine's Gift it was, was about the same time. So if you were ever going to get into a sport and develop the love for particularly the trotters, you, you picked the right time. Yeah, yeah, no, it was amazing, really. Like, um, and it was just a, a fluke thing, really. Like, um, Dad had only just, you really started getting going. I mean, he'd, he'd trained a lot of winners, but um, I think it, um, following on from um, Role Model, um, this was quite some years later. And um, obviously, um, you know, Allegra Agitato, started winning the group ones and then um, you know Jasmine's gift followed and one over Kenny followed and he had a lot of, a lot of nice trotters you know sort of going through the grades um, at the same time so as you say it was pretty easy to um, get up in the morning and work them that's for sure. What do you remember of the early part of your driving career I know it took six or seven drives to get a win with with Brooker which appropriately was was for your dad but was driving always going to be a massive part of it? Or I assume as a young fella it was. Yeah, it really, it really was. Once I started driving, I just really um, en enjoyed it and, and still do. But um, definitely in those days, it was definitely a big goal to, um, you know, to drive winners. And, um, you know, yeah, it just, yeah, it was something I always had to, you know, watching racing and we're obviously a, a heavily involved racing family growing up and watching Sort of trackside more than we were watching anything else on television and you know had idols like Tony Hurlihy and 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 you know Ricky May and these guys that were just sort of um you know you're always looking up to so you always want to do the driving thing and I you know it just started off like that and sort of um went from there really but um yeah I was I was hopeful I was going to you know make a driver. Did you model yourself on anyone early on was, was the one that stood out? Um, not really particularly, I think I just, um, probably because I was a little bit taller than a lot of other drivers, I sort of had to sort of come up with my own style a little bit. Um, but yeah, I like, I mean, you, you always look at the good drivers and sort of want to be, want to be like them. I think, um, you know, obviously Tony Hurley, he was my idol, um, you know, as he is most people's idol, I suppose. But um, no, I, I will say a lot of good drivers or, or great drivers um, gave me a lot of advice in those early days and were always willing to help and um, 
you know, I, you know, there was Colin Filippi and a lot of those great drivers that were really, um, you know, supportive, and that really helped in the early days. I think Brooker got your second win as well. A um, couple of hundred wins as a junior driver, great time in your life, and and some lifelong friends that you you made up there. Yeah, absolutely, great times. Yeah. Um, a lot different now. Just sort of really probably didn't appreciate how great those times are. You've you've sort of. Um, you know, you haven't got the sort of financial stresses you do when you, as you get a bit older and things, and just you know, travelling and and really sort of, um, you know, enjoying every race meeting and yeah, a lot of great friends, a lot of great people that were sort of juniors at the same time I was, and uh, you know, managed to qualify for the champs over in Australia, and that was a, a heck of a trip and a great week, and met some lifelong friends not only in this country but over there as well. So. Um, yeah, no, great times as a junior, and um, yeah, no, I was very lucky I was as successful as I was. Family obviously had some great times with Jasmine's Gift, and, and you were a huge part of that. I think you got an Ordeal Cup early on, and then a trotting free for all on a, a rather wet day at Addington where you made the front and um, yeah, made your name, so to speak. Yeah, no, I still remember the day. Um, yeah, no, huge thrill. Um, you know, she was just a great mare, you know, um, I just, I, I was probably just so fortunate that um, Dad owned her and and gave me the drive on her and it just started off, Dad was still driving quite heavily then and it just started off, I'd, I'd only been a season a junior I think and it was my, going into my second season and um, I used to do a lot of the work with her and it just happened that um, Dad said, look, if, if um, you know, you guys, if you're, you're doing the work, you might as well, um, you know, have a go on her. It was a winter meeting at, at Addington and she'd just come back from a stint in Australia and uh, ended up winning and I think stuck with her and ended up winning about five in a row and then um, yeah it went on to the, the, the free-for-all so no it was a massive day and a massive day for the family that day. We had a really good day. Well Allegro Agitato ran third and, and I think Glenn Bogan might have been second. Pom Pelly who went on to win a Dominion so yeah. it wasn't a soft field. No that's right. I think that was the week before the Dominion which she um, we run second and third in the Dominion that year and um, what's under my kilt, I think he won the yep. Dominion but he was, yeah, he finished further down the field that day so no, it was a good field and um, no, she's a great mare and loved the wet conditions, you know, she's really tough. While we're focusing in on some of these trotters that you've been associated with, the, the horse that put your name in lights very, very quickly and, and developed into one of our best free-for-allers was Springbank Richard. What did, what did you think of him early on? Yeah, well he'd come from um, Tony Barron from down this way and and Dad had had a little bit of luck with an, another horse for the same owner um, earlier on, and he, he was proving a little bit of a headache. Um, he had a lot of ability, but he was, um, yeah, we were highly strung and did a few things wrong. So he came to Dad without sort of a lot of expectation as far as we knew he had ability. But um, yeah, I think he arrived, might have been in, in January, and he was winning the, the Harness Jewels in, in June. So it was a huge sort of. Um, yeah, huge step, but he just had natural ability right from the word go, and um, yeah, he, he just, you know, he just, he was just good. There was no two ways about it. That was the first jewels, and you're right. He obviously came from Tony's, and I think he won three of his first four for for your dad, and and going in, into that harness jewels, it was a new a new concept. You're a young guy trying to make your your name, and he came off the second row from memory, and yep. and had to do some work, and didn't get there by by a whole lot. Um, but it was the start of a, a great association with him. Oh, he was a great horse. Like I, I've got to honestly say, I don't think I'd be sitting here now in the position I am, Greg, without him. Like he was, um, as you say, put me in my name up there um, for many, many years in a row. And um, look, uh, you know, as I say, that first Jules, it was something really special. That first Jules, it was, it was something you never forget a day like that. And um, I was just young and just so fortunate and, and wrapped and excited to have a drive in the race. And um, yeah, the way the way the race panned out, I still remember he galloped in the score up and he and he settled luckily pretty quickly, and we sort of missed the start by four or five. But it it probably wasn't a bad thing because I think just in those days, if he was right up there and keyed up, he may have made a mistake um, racing into the first bend or something like that. So yeah, no, it was a, a big performance to win it, and he actually towed a flat tyre for the last half as well. So it was a it was a great run, and he sort of stamped that he was a, a really top horse that day. He know. went to Australia after that, didn't he? Did, did yeah. He got the Vic Derby. Yeah, yep. He won the Victoria Derby, so that was a huge thrill because we'd been there two years prior, and I'd stayed over in Australia with one over Kenny for about six weeks, and just yep. just I wasn't driving at that stage, but just looked after. Her. 
and she got beat her nose in the Victoria Derby and it was sort of dead or said, oh, gee, I've, you know, it hurt a bit. And it was sort of a real good, real good way to sort of go back over there and, and, and win that Derby. And uh, the way he done it was real impressive, you know. And of course, he came back to the duels the next year at Cambridge and became one of the first dual duels winners. Like changeover did it on the same day. Um, uh, again, he, look, he got the right barrier that day. He got the front and he was way too good for King Charlie, but um, pretty special to do that back to back. Yeah, back to back. It was really, really good. I think he'd only, yeah, I could be wrong, but I think he'd only just suffered about one defeat since, or maybe two defeats since Dad had trained him then. And I think he won about, you know, could have been... Um, six or seven on the bounce in the middle there. So he he was sort of stamping himself as a real quality horse and um, yeah, totally different from the year before. A lot of pressure on that year um, going in a short price favourite compared to sort of, um, you know, no expectations the year before. So um, it was great to get it done and, you know, certainly satisfying to, to win on that day. And the Dominion, I guess it's the same scenario. Great thing to get it done, but, but really special for your dad. Yeah, real special with Dad because we'd, you know, obviously tried and failed many times before and it's it's the New Zealand Cup of trotting and to win it, um, massive, massive thrill and, and to go in, with, as I say, with a short price favourite as well, it adds pressure. Not so much once the starter says go, it doesn't feel like that, but it's it's the build up to it and you sort of, um, the anticipation of sort of, you know, getting out there and getting it done, so no, it was great and, um, yeah, probably didn't appreciate at the time how big it was, but, um, Certainly looking back, it was a, a massive thrill and um, yeah, great to win it for the family. You're a pretty laid back character. How, how do you handle that sort of pressure, especially at, at a young age? Um, what do you remember of the build up and, and what are your nerves like on, on race day? I'll get to what it's like now that you're a trainer driver, yeah. but just as the driver, how did you handle it? Really, really good. I think it's it's a strange thing. I, I um, never never get nervy or, or wound up or, or or anything like that. I think you get excited leading into it because you you know how hard it is to get drives in these races, let alone good drives, so you're excited for the opportunity and I think um you never ever try to um yeah, I, I, I always think about I'm not doing any running, the horse is doing the running, so there's no point in me getting nervous and it's only gonna cloud my judgment or what, what you think's right at the time. So never worry me with nerves but um it's always exciting leading into those races and I I do remember the build-up to that week was because, you know, everyone's sort of half shaking your hand before the race, you know, that's that adds a little bit of pressure just in itself, but um, no, it's a, it just you just want to get it out there and get it done, and then it's, you know, it's, it's all good, but um, yeah, no, it was a great week, and um, yeah, he was a great horse. What about Dad? What's he like leading into one of those races? Um, and is he an instruction man? be honest here. <laughs> well he would say oh no I leave it up to the drivers but uh, he doesn't really especially especially with us boys because I think he sort of um, he still sort of acts as the coach if you like and um, I know uh, you know um, Ricky or, or Blair or Tony or that will probably yeah, just leave it to them but with us he sort of always likes to you know put his point across but he, he's pretty he's pretty you know he's pretty good to drive for and I mean I suppose it's a fact too with being family that if you do make an error um, he's not sure to tell you about it but um, he'd still um, you know defend you to the to, to anybody else too so um, no that part of it was you know driving for dad was great he always had a lot of confidence when you drove for dad because you knew the horses were ready and they were um, you know generally um, always very competitive you know. Describe your dad as a trainer to me. What, what, what are some of his attributes or his greatest attributes? And, and he's been the biggest influence on your career, obviously. Yeah. So, so what have you gleaned the most out of him? I would say dad's, uh, to some dad's up, is a very laid back approach, but it's also um, understanding and he, he's obviously self-taught in a lot of ways to his training style. And, and but his ability to self-analyse is the best, his best attribute, I think. You know, he he can he works the horse out pretty quickly and understands what they need when they're at their most happy, when they're you know doing their best or racing their best, and how to get that out of them. Whereas you know, um, there's no strict schedule to how he'll train them, um, when he'll train them, what he'll do with them. You know, it's very laid back, and I think you can just sort of see the horses settling and under sort of it doesn't work with all of them and but I think he's also you know if it's not working he's willing to change as well so it's 
yeah, he's just got a, you know, he likes to treat all of them as individuals, and um, yeah, it's it's worked for him very well, you know, especially with the trotters. Um, I think it, you know, helps. They're, um, you know, the, probably a lot of the Sundorns were highly strung, and he seemed to um, really gel with them, you know. Yeah, definitely. I laugh at you <laughs> saying he's laid back and he can work them any time. That, that is the absolute truth, isn't it? It, yeah. it could be nothing to start working them that little bit later in the morning to what most stables and, and still yeah. be mucking around with them at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, 2 yeah. or 3 o'clock. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. They, they always used to say they, they race in the afternoon, they don't race in the morning. <laughs> so, But I, look, I think um, a lot of that too is with the travel they do as well, like um, getting home at, from Addington at you know 3 o'clock in the morning and then... I mean, it, it never worried Dad to say, oh, we better get up and get going at six in the morning to get them done by lunchtime. It was just a fact of, look, when, when we get up and start working, then we will, and, um, you know, they'll all, they'll all, they'll all get worked. And, and you know, uh, paddock training is a big thing too. That Dad, Dad's horses are, 99.9% um, .9 of them are, are trained in the paddock, and they seem happy out there, and especially the way he has his farm set up and everything, it sort of, um, you know, really works well for him and has done for years, so... Yeah, it's a very laid back way of doing it and, it, and it works good. Correct me if I'm wrong. Off the back of that second Jules win with uh, Springbank Richard, is that is that when you came down and worked for Kirk Larson? Yeah, so I, th I think I started about three or four days after and worked for Kirk. Started working for Kirk, and um, yeah, just Maddie was coming through then, and um, I'd been, you know, having a great deal of success. I was getting a lot of drives down in the south. Um, as we see, it's the same now. A lot of the juniors come down and they get well supported by the locals down here. And I just sort of um, thought it was a, a good time to sort of perhaps branch out a little bit and make a bit of a move. And um, we did that. And uh, yeah, so that was when that was, yeah. Yeah, look, without n naming too many of the trainers and not trying to leave any out, but um, Billy Heads, you had quite a few winners for him. Jeff and Judith Knight. I think those last couple of seasons as a junior, and obviously Kirk provided you with a few too, um, you drove about 40 odd winners. and well and truly half of them were down here yeah yeah absolutely yeah um no um yeah like they were good supporters of me in those days and um yeah like it, it was one of those things if, if you're getting the results things just snowball and um yeah i thought it was a good opportunity maddie was just starting out and um you know it, it sort of gave him a wee bit of a leg up too to to get the drives that perhaps if i was still at mum and dad's might have been getting so we weren't we weren't fighting for the drives. I had Springbank Richard, and I told him that he, he wasn't getting on there. But on <laughs> um, apart from that, he sort of had the you know the pick of them, and um, he did obviously really well too. You know, yep. so. the trainer's license and taking that out, you still you took that out when you were a junior. Yeah, so I worked down at Kirk's for a year, and I decided um, I'd had a few people um, ask whether you know I'd be interested in training horses and whether I could, and just working at Kirk's, I couldn't. But I felt like um, I was getting well supported as a junior with my driving, and I thought, well, it might be a good time now, while I had that income, to maybe um, you know build up a, an owner base or whatever if I could, and um, start training a few. And I was only just doing young ones at that stage, and sort of come through from there. But um, yeah, so I still had a year of my junior, and I thought, well, being a junior and one of the leading juniors, I was getting well supported. Um, while I had that income to fall back on, I should. Um, you know, have a wee go at the training and see who we go. And your first winner ended up being a Dominion winner. Yeah, yeah, and no, I got pretty lucky to start off with a horse so good. Yeah, Charlie Smale was, he said, look, you know, have a try with this trotter. He was proving a bit of a handful in those early days, and he was a bit of a handful, but um, one thing he had was a ton of ability. And um, yeah, it was a shame really that I probably um, was a little bit inexperienced in those days and perhaps didn't get the best out of him either. And um, you know, he ended up on the beach and doing a, a super job for um, Johnny and Amber there. Yeah, Jack Adjusty, of course, uh, winner of the Dominion at, at decent long odds. And your second training success, a mate of yours was sitting in the cart that's done okay in this business too. Yeah, he made it as a driver, you could say. <laughs> but um, yeah, that was Burano for, um, that was really special too, because it was later on the same day and um, um, ben and Karen Calder, whose property I was training out of, um, to win a race for them was really, really cool. And um, yeah, obviously Dexter was driving, and uh, yeah, I was glad in a way that I'd I'd won earlier in the day because um, yeah, if he'd driven my first winner, it wouldn't have been so good. <laughs> You'd but, still be hearing yeah, about I'd it. Yeah, still be hearing about it. But no, it was really, no, really special. And uh, no, me and Dex were great mates and still are. And uh, yeah, it was a huge thrill to. It was a big night that one. Yep, you jumped from nine to 35 wins in 2013 from only 160 starters so 
that stuff you were talking about from your father before, one of the things that lives with me around him is his strike rate, and you, you've taken that into your training. Yeah, well, just I think it's um, yeah, just trying to place your horses in the right races, Greg, and 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 not only that, just um, I suppose with driving as well, you understand, you know, um, I suppose what's good and what's not good, and and how to try and you know um, keep your horses. You know, dad, dad had obviously installed a lot of that, and I'd learnt, you know, some really um, good stuff from Kirk too with the pacing side of things. And I trained a lot of pacing winners in those years as well. And Kirk, you know, there was no one better down here with a young horse than Kirk, getting them up and going. So, um, yeah, I just sort of tried to, you know, just sort of take little bits from here and there and build on that. And uh, yeah, had a really, really good season that season, and that was definitely snowballed and. Had a big, big backing from Ben and Karen that year too, so it was great. Bet's Best was a trotter that won four or five races, I think, in that season. And um, Lather on Wheel was another one that I think performed pretty well for you. Yeah, yeah, no, he, yeah, no, he was, he was a, he was a good trotter. He was a half brother of the Fiery Ginger, so he was, um, yeah, he did a good job and could have done more um, without a, yeah, an injury mishap. But um, yeah, Bet's Best was a mere, um, a syndicate bought off uh, mum and dad. And uh, we raced her, and yeah, she had a great record. I think she won about eight from twenty, and she was a really good mare. So um, that, yeah, that that was a huge part in that season. And um, yeah, when you're getting that kind of success, things um, become a lot easier. You end up getting a lot better quality of animal to work with, and um, as I said, it just snowballs from there. Some of the challenges when you get decent horses, well, the first part's finding them, but the second part is you've often got to travel with them, and a young trainer looking for that type of horse she came up with Tasman Bromac and yeah he, he quickly got your training name up in lights didn't he yeah he was a great little horse um, first horse I sort of bought from the sales Tasman Bromac oh, I might have been there the year before and we bought O'Need and Mac but yep. um, Tasman Bromac he was sort of I went there with a wee bit of a budget and I, pro I think I just went over the budget but um, really liked the the horse and he you know he went on to be a great wee horse and um, yeah, and no, he took took us a few places and and run some big races and in big races too. So um, yeah, no, he he was a he was a super wee horse and um, no, we just loved him to bits. You had the confidence to take him to Auckland and that was vindicated when he ran second in a in a Taylor Mile behind a Miracle Mile, a one forty six point nine Miracle Mile winner in my field marshal uh, or field marshal as he was here, and then you ran fifth to him in the jewels. So um, he deserved that trip north, and it probably made the horse and it made you a wee bit as a trainer. I think so. Like he was, um, yeah. He, I sent him up. I couldn't be away at that time, and I sent him up to Robert Dunn, and they looked after him super and did a super job with him. And um, he was, yeah, he went up there with, um, you know, um, some good form, and we were sort of hopeful rather than confident as you would be going up against those type of horses. He'd run a, a close, a close third to field marshal just before going up there, and he'd run a, you know, real, real competitive race. So um, yeah, we'd sort of. Thought we'd go and have a try, and yeah, second in the Taylor Mile, and 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 his fifth in the the Jewels. He was slightly unlucky from his draw. He just sort of didn't get a much of a crack at them. So um, yeah, great wee horse, and uh, you know we had a, you know a lot of thrills with him. I think he might have won his last start before he was sold. And I want to get on to that because it's been a big part of your training career selling horses, and there's a couple of them that you probably didn't want to sell, but that's just the way life goes sometimes. But it is a huge part of a trainer's life, particularly when you're trying to set yourself up, because the percentage, obviously, as a result of selling them, can go a long way to your A, getting a property or developing what you've got, or B, getting some more horses. It's absolutely, um, you know, we we do, you know, particularly when you, as you say, you're getting established and you're setting up, Greg, it's a big part of that, um, you know, financially, day-to-day um, -day training, there's not a lot of money in it. Um, you can make a living out of it, but it's it's getting ahead is probably done on your, um, you know, your, your training percentages of your sales or, or your sales if you, you know, you own them yourself. So um, it is a big part of it. And although it's sad to lose sometimes horses like that, um, it does make way for the next wave coming through. And, um, you know, that's, yeah, basically how we survive. I hope there's a stage in life where we can, you know, say, no, look, we're going to race all these horses. But... Um, there's still a few things to pay for yet, so um, 
you know, but it's, it's getting to that stage, which is good. Before we talk a little bit more about some of those horses, and there's, there's a fair list starting to be established by you, what about this place here? Tell me, how did you end up here, and, and what sort of size property do, do we have? Yeah, so um, we've got 35 acres here, Greg. Um, it was a 70 acre block, and I was very lucky. Um, uh, my wife's mother and father bought the 35 acres next door. So we've sort of, between us, we've got the 70 acres here and they've got sort of, um, you know, they're set up for um, adjustment and everything like that over next door and, and had the broodmares there earlier on, um, which they, you know, used to do the stud side of it. So, um, yeah, 35 acres here. We just bought this block as bare land and, and built it all from scratch, if you like. So, um, yeah, it was a bit of an investment or sort of a, a bit of an undertaking to do it. But, um, yeah, now looking back on it, it's really good and... Um, yeah, we've been able to manage to keep ahead above water so far, so it's um, yeah, it's it's going to be worth it in the long run. So that's your wife, Katie. She was a Jones then. Yep. Um, so they're the Kenna Craig people, aren't they? Yeah. Yep. So Kenna Craig started. They were they were in Balfour. Yep. Um, yeah, Kenna Craig started. So Ross Ross and Robin had um, yeah, Kenna Craig started there. So they sold their farm and moved down here, and then set up a a bit. Of, well, Kerry Kenna Craig started on next door here for a while. And then just sort of slowly, um, yeah, eased out of that, and uh, now they just are just my <laughs> racehorses that are go for a break, and and have got brood mares, some brood mares, and that of their own as well. So um, yeah, they've got the 35 acres next door, and it's really handy. Yeah, I bet it works well. It, it means that when you are spelling some of these nice horses, you can just poke your head through the the hedge and see how they're doing, and decide when they come back in, whether they need more time, all of that that sort Ab of thing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's exactly. It's really handy and. Um, yeah, no, Ross um, is always here every day and helps out as well, and um, he's a vital part of the team, and uh, no, we all get on really good, and it works out really good. Yeah, tell me about the team and the, and the staff that you have here. I see Wayne Adams is floating around doing his thing and, and helping you out. Someone of his ilk and a Group 1 winning trainer that he is, that, that must be a nice sounding board at times, and uh, you've got young Oliver Kite, and... Um, without these types of people, it would make it difficult to uh, to do the job and, and do the, the job that you are doing. Yeah, well, when you get, you know, as you know, when you get, um, you know, numbers start creeping up, you can't do it all yourself. You need need help. And, um, no, I've been very lucky over the years. I've had some super staff work for me um, through the time and, um, no, made, made lifelong friends out of them as well. So, um, yeah, no, we've got a good staff and group here of about four four workers or um, and, a, and a couple of helpers. As I say, Wayne Wayne comes and um, lends a hand after he's finished with his horses every day. And um, yeah, as you say, their um, help and experience and things like that is just um, you know it's it's great and it's um, you know makes makes us be able to do what we do really. You know, married for now. This is an interesting story. We talked about this a couple of days ago. Seven. Seven or eight years, is it? No, it was seven years. Seven years. <laughs> yeah, no, I remember. And how do you remember the date? And, and be honest. <laughs> yeah, well, so I remember that the night. It was quite a deep breath, by the way. Yeah, the night the night before I got married, I, we were I was driving at um, Forbury Park. So I know I drove two or three winners that night. So whenever I struggle for the date of when I get married, I can easily just have a look up and, <laughs> and remember remember the winners I drove on that night. So, but no, it was seven years ago, and uh, yeah, no, it's, it's time travels quickly, but um, yeah, no, it's been great, and obviously we've uh, developed this property up ourselves, and uh, yeah, no, it's, uh, you know, two lovely children, another one on the way, so no, it's uh, very exciting. Is there a future? The kids, I suppose, are pretty young now at the moment, but interest there? Yeah, well, you don't really know, Greg. Um, as you say, it's it's too early days, but there's a bit of interest there for sure. Millie loves ponies, and um, you know she's uh, yeah, no, she's. So you got a pony for Christmas? Yeah, she yeah. got a pony for Christmas, and um, yeah, no, she's she's keen, and and Lockie, he's two, but um, he's keen on anything at the moment. So yeah, who knows? But um, yeah, I'll just look, I won't be. Um, forcing them into it or anything like that, but if they've got an interest and want to do it, um, I won't be stopping them. Millie knows the good horses, doesn't she? She she knows the, the stars of the stable. Yeah, yeah, yeah oh, she knows, yeah, no, and she watches, and you know, I said to the other day, did you watch Dad drive, and how did I go today? And she said, yeah, but you only won two races today, Dad. So <laughs> she is following in, she Keep is watching, grounded. but yeah, yeah. So, yep. but uh, no, she does, yeah, she does, does have an interest, so it was good. Tell you what, you had a smart trotter and, and dark horse, um, what a motor. 
massive motor, yeah. Just a really, really good horse from day one, Greg. I knew just getting her going, and I, I, you know, obviously Dad had had so many good horses, and I thought to myself, gee, I've got one, you know. Yep. Like, it was really the first, actually, she's, she's the first horse. Taz was really good, and a really good horse, but she was just the first one I knew that was something a wee bit different, and, um, yeah, really good horse. Yeah, she won on debut. I think it was Christmas time of... 2015, bred by the Grices. It was the dependable Joanne, that family. So yeah. she had that on her side as well. Um, so you got the business done at start number one and, and you quickly decided she was capable of heading north. Yeah, so we, I think she won her first two and then um, she had a couple of other starts. She may have missed a start um, after that. And yeah, we sort of set her for the Oaks. Um, I think I may have made a wee bit of an error. She trolled the week before the Oaks and she trolled <laughs> like too good you know she yep. um she run i think she might have trotted a 55 half against the paces and just did it nice but um i can remember thinking oh gee i hope i haven't left my my run there and i may have done you know um she wasn't i think she finished midfield in the oaks but um yeah as we sort of um you know she got older and stronger too she was um just getting better and um yeah we we ventured up country a few times later on yeah well look she won about five races leading into the Harness Jewels, which was won by Wilma's mate, and she was actually favourite for that. Mm. Um, and a big syndicate of owners, and, and an important syndicate for you, because, um, yeah, they, they gave you the opportunity to race this horse and, and, and pretty much do what you wanted to do with it. Yeah, they're great, a great ownership group, Greg. You couldn't speak highly enough of, of Mark and the team, really. Um, never ever sort of put pressure on a trainer or, you know, um, tell you what to do, or they left it up to... To, to me and um, I honestly do believe um, that, that you know you can get the best results out of the horse by doing that you know what I mean I know every owner wants wants the best for the horse too but um, yeah we just never had any pressure with her and um, yeah you know just just a really good horse so Greg she was easy to sort of um, you know make make the right decisions with really yeah look she was placed in behind great things happen and the trotting free for all and you had your your problems with her but almost her most bravest performance was her last one mm. when she got beaten by one apollo but it, it for me summed up her as a, as a racehorse she was just a really great mare i honestly you would just never know what may have become if she hadn't been injured you know um I, i'll never forget the day i bring her in and she was injured but um yeah, look, she was developing into something I think could have been potentially a Group 1 winner, if not a jewel, or, yep. you know, she just felt like she was just, you know, just really going to, you know, reach the heights, I'd hoped, and then, um, yeah, through injury, she, she sort of probably never never achieved what she could have achieved, but, um, yeah, massive run that last start she raced in, um, you know, I think she beat the national record by a couple of seconds in defeat, so it just goes to show how good she was, and, um, you know, yeah, just a shame really, we um, we never cracked the group one with her. Frank Santino was another a really nice performer, won eight or nine races for you. Yeah, he went 52 one day at Winton, he was a good horse. Um, yeah, just a horse that was just below the best ones, but um, pretty good all the same, you know. Regazzo Mac, he wasn't. No, he was he was a special horse, Greg. Um, yeah, he, just a, a really, really good good horse that um, you always knew was good but um, when when he raced he found out he was better than good you know so um, yeah no he was he was he was really special look he got beaten at his second start behind dashing major I think he was beating a nose and that was a, a cracking contest but he got you a race that you were after a supremacy yeah yeah no he did um, look it's yeah yeah, it's still a huge thrill, Greg, just even thinking back to that because... Um, was he sold at that stage? So he'd come through the derby, which yeah. we'll, we'll touch on as well, but was he sold at that stage? Yeah, yeah. so he was he was sold um, and he raced for New Connections, which they were so good, you know, they left him here and um, probably slightly fortunate with COVID that the flights weren't going that, like they were prior to that. And um, so, you know, he stayed here and um, oh, they were great owners to train for with him. Um, they as I said, left it up to me and we sort of had the, the derby and then the, the supremacy and the jewels in mind. So, um, yeah, to crack that supremacy, though, Greg, I'd been narrowly beaten in it before and I'd run, I think I might have had three or four placings in the race um, with different horses of my own and, um, yeah, to finally crack it. It was a race I'd always sort of, when Tasman Romick got beat, it just haunted me a little and uh, to win it 
finally was just such a big thrill and the way he did it you know it was um, pretty special and um, yeah no it's right up there. A rare salute from you too that's that, that that summed it up for me. Yeah you yeah, know I was pumped like um, it was you know, and, and sometimes, you know, um, people say, well, it was, you know, a $50,000 Group 2, but it was so, so much more than that, you know. I've probably, if it won a Group 1 race, it, it wouldn't have been quite as special. It just meant a bit, and it just sort of, um, you know, when it's on your home patch and um, it was really sort of monkey off the back stuff, you know, it was really special. Well, you knew he was a Derby horse. I remember talking to you about that prior to the Derby series, and he proved against the pace and prides, and it's all about faith, that he, yeah. that he was up to it. But the... I'm not going to say the wheels came off in, in the derby, which was won by Krug. Yeah. Um, but to then bounce back and prove to those owners yep. what, it, what he was about. Yeah, that's right. He, it just Things just didn't go right, and just for whatever reason, he just had a, had a bad month, I suppose you'd say. You know, he raced well below par, and um, even though there wasn't a lot wrong with him, he wasn't right. Yep. And it just bringing him back home and got him back into his own routine, and um, you could almost feel during the week before leading into that supremacy he was coming back right you know and um yeah he was he was super there and and in the jewels too i thought his run in the jewels was mighty like um he ran fourth but he he drew bad and went around and sat parked and he was only sort of um you know a length from the winner so he was meritorious there too so he sort of you know finished his career in new zealand on a high really this factory of young horses particularly three-year-olds continued with pembroke playboy um it's remarkable how you're on this roll with these these types of horses, isn't it? Well, it's we've been very fortunate, but I've got to say that I've got really good owners who have been willing to sort of you know either back me at the sales and and or um, go and buy some nice horses or or breed them, you know. So we've had some quality stock coming through, and um, you know you can't do it without the horses. So I've been very fortunate that we've um, either selected right or ended up you know um, the owners of bred well and we've been able to um, sort of bring these horses through but um, yeah he, he right from day one he was pretty smart too and um, he just got better and better. Yep he missed out winning a delayed supremacy beaten by one of Mark Jones's I think um, Burnham Boy might, might have beaten him um, but there's a real story behind this horse and often there is when it comes to sometimes the connections and that's certainly the case with this horse. Yeah well Chris, Chris Alcock, I hadn't met him before and he, he arrived at the stables here one day and he said, look, I want you to go to the sales and buy me a horse and um, he had one penciled out and we, we went and looked at it at the sales and I said to, said to Chris, I said, look, he's not really my type, this one that we were looking at buying. I said, look, do you mind if we go have a look at some better's delights? And he said, oh, yeah, OK. And he outlaid how, or told me how much money he had to spend. So we went and, we went and um, looked at him and selected Pembroke Playboy, but he... He said, look, um, my, his wife was very ill and she said, look, we've saved up some money, um, you know. <laughs> we're quite, you know, he said, you, she, she'd said to him, I'd, you know, you're going to have to do something when I'm gone, you know. So it was quite emotional the day he sort of, um, you know, won some of these bigger races because I know Chris was thinking, you know, about his wife and everything like that. And, um, yeah, it was, yeah, it, it was just a great story. And I think, um, you know, he's... Um, yeah, and, and he's knocked back some considerable offers because of that reason too, you know. The money around for these types of horses is, is pretty incredible. So to be able to retain this horse has is, is meant a lot to you, I know. And when he won the Central Otago and then the Invercargill Cup, I think he beat the fixer. Yep. Um, then he went to Addington and he won the Summer Cup. And you drove him really positively that night. He, he beat Self Assured, a cup winner. That, that was when we had a discussion and you said to me, I think I've got, I've got a horse that can win a New Zealand Cup. Yeah, well at that stage, especially too, that race was only over a sprint trip and I know I'd always, even though he'd never run over the two mile at that stage, I always really knew he was a good star. He, everything he told me about himself and work and everything like that, it just, um, you know, goes goes over the ground easy and he just would relax and he just, um, you know, he, he screamed to me that he'd be a really good star. So I um, had a bit of a plan in my mind. Obviously, the cup is the ultimate goal. And I think anyone that's grown up and racing in New Zealand, the New Zealand Cup is, it's the pinnacle of it. And... Um, yeah, had a plan right from that stage to sort of bring him through the Easter Cup and sort of dip my toe in the water, if you like, and, and build towards the New Zealand Cup. So 
Um, that night was sort of a night that sort of told me that he was right up with him. He obviously beat two New Zealand Cup winners that he night. Did. So yep. um, Self Assure was second and the Fixer was third. So it was a real, um, yeah, a real thrill to think, gee, I've got, I've got a horse that can be competitive with these, you know. And the build-up to the Cup was pretty much going the way you wanted it to. Yeah, like um, it would run fourth in the Easter Cup and with a shade of luck he'd have been very very close to winning the Easter Cup really. I know he'd had a head start on those other horses but he hit the line as good as anything and that was his first run over the two miles so the spring had gone super and yeah everything was just um, just so right for the for the Cup but it um, wasn't to be great again. Is, is that your biggest disappointment to date in your training career? Yeah, yeah. It was hard to take, Greg. I mean, you sort of put so much into it. I know, look, I was very fortunate to be in the position, but um, you just really do, you know, eat, drink and sleep it. And that was, um, you know, just to have a runner in the cup is a big thing, and especially a runner that you think can be competitive. So whatever happened was going to happen, but um, everything had just gone so well. It was going too well, and his training was just going super. And then um, for him to become, you know... To end up injured was just um, gutting, but um, oh, well, we move on. You moved on. You, you freshened him up, and he lined up in his defensive as Invercargill Cup. And oh, what about the performance that day? Yeah, he come. He, yeah, well, that was a thrill too because um, you know he'd come back and he was fresh. And um, yeah, we were sort of yeah sort of wanting to defend the Invercargill Cup if we could. And um, just to get him back from injury was a was a big thing to you know, sort of have him race again and, uh, yeah, nearly pulled it off, so that was great. And he worked hard and he was parked out and those other horses had, you know, a huge advantage over him um, through being able to race. Uh, but anyway, he, he, he was very brave. Then then you almost went through the same thing again leading into the race. Yeah, yeah, similar, well, similar injury, just, um, you know, he, he perhaps wasn't racing in as good a form as we'd hoped. Um, he'd had two or three starts subsequent to that, and although I think he was a couple of seconds and a fourth, but... Um, slightly disappointed and and then his last run was well below par and he he pulled up with an injury and um yeah so that was curtains on that as well so he's been um you know there's been a lot of highs but there's been some lows with him but um hopefully we're behind all that now and building towards a new campaign bugger me if another one hasn't dropped in by the name of sandwave we'll get to his monkeyer and what people are calling him uh now but um this horse is, is remarkable because he didn't jump out of the blocks like a, a superstar right from the get-go, did he? Yeah, you're right, he is remarkable because he's been one of those horses that I'd never ever um, you know, thought of in the same ilk as those two horses you mentioned, Pembroke and Regazzo, but he's he's just slowly got better and better and better and just a little by little he's got better and... Um, one thing he has got, he's always had a great attitude. He always, you know, eats and, and, and works well. He never works good, but he never works bad. He's always just one of those ones does what he has to, and he's just kept stepping up. And, um, yeah, he was doing some really great things at the end, so um, we're looking forward to this season. How, how did you get him? How, how did that come about? Yeah, so I went to the yearling sales, and uh, um, the year before, I think we'd, we'd been tried to buy some horses, or I tried to buy some horses for our clients, and... They had a minimal budget, and and we just the ones I was looking at trying to buy, we just couldn't afford. So I I pulled three groups of owners together, and we thought well, we can have a crack at something really decent, and we still got blown out of the water. So I never I never bought anything, and I come home empty-handed. And I said, well look, we'll we'll try and look for something up and going. It's a easier way to get these guys into it. It was 12 months further ahead, and um, I spotted them at the Miffin workouts. And I looked up his breeding, and he was well bred, being a full brother to Bonnie Joan. Yep. And I just really, there was something I liked about him. And um, so um, Peter Lagan had a big hand in um, going and looking at him, and and watched him trial. And then we sort of, you know, um, done the deal that way. I went up and drove him, and liked what I what I felt. And yeah, just did it that way. And he's just um, Simon had done a great job with him. He's just got impeccable manners, and um, for a sun beach somewhere who, you know, from, from what I'd heard, I'd never trained one before, but they could get a little bit warm. Um, he had such a, you know, laid-back nature to him, and he was lovely, so I um, bought him, and, yeah, it's been a good move. Well, look, he won on debut, and then I think he had four or five placings in a row, and then he strung them together, including a supremacy win, where it's the first time you've driven him like that, where you've gone, right, he's the best horse in the race, I'm going to take this race by the scruff of the neck. And you not only did it in that race, you did it when you came to Addington as well. Yeah, well, he, yeah, he's, he's not a very good leader, Greg. Um, 
It was the biggest thing leading into the supremacy. I was worried because with the scratching of beach ball, I sort of found myself thinking we're well, probably going to have to leave here. I'm going to, or I'm going to have to try and do do as what you see dictate the race because um, you know he he sort of had to prove himself as the best horse. And um, I'd driven in that way once before in a in a probably what you'd say a weak race at Winton, and he won, but he didn't win very impressively and. He looked pretty ordinary, to be honest, and he's just the type of horse. He doesn't run away from them. He won't ever win by a fancy margin, but he's he's pretty good at just getting it done. So, um, and even you know his last win was was better still. Like he was he was you know he's starting to sort of um, understand what this game's all about. So um, he's he's been a great wee horse, and we're looking forward to you know even stepping him up further and taking on the very best and see how he handles that. I've seen it first hand, they named him the Southern Tsunami and the support behind him feel, felt like that up on the <laughs> Victor's uh, dais here at Addington. There's some characters involved in this horse isn't there? And they're from everywhere. Yeah, they're, yeah and it's, that's really good isn't it, you know, they come from everywhere. I mean the, the supremacy, it was, uh, yeah. They, crazy it was, scenes. Oh, it, was, it was crazy scenes all right and they were, you know, like they were, they just really wrapped i mean they're probably lucky too the first step into it for a lot of them and they've got ended up with such a nice horse but um yeah very vocal and uh no they're loving the ride and uh long mate continue nate you're you're getting close to um this thousand one club of which there's about 26 odd that are that are in there your brother's one of those and when you think about some of the names that are that are in there um god willing you, you get your thousand wins what, what will that mean to nathan williamson yeah, that'll be really big, Greg. Um, nowadays, you know, I was I was a driver, and now I sort of feel like I'm a I'm a trainer that drives now. Yeah. Um, obviously, the as the team gets bigger, um, I don't do the travel that I used to. Um, you know, obviously, Maddie and Omaru, he's got he goes both ways, and uh, and a lot of the drivers now, Blair and things get you know do a lot of travelling, which is something that I really can't do now with the team here and. Um, that I probably don't want to do either as you know got family and things like that but um, yeah it's something that I'd never really thought of too much I always hope you can get up to there but um, once once I got to sort of 800 and 900 you sort of think well the next one's going to be a thousand that's going to be really special because um, I still remember the day Colin de Phillipe got a thousand in Omaru and I was just very young and I remember thinking like that's amazing you know and and it is amazing and it just if I could get there gee it'll be a thrill you know like um, it'll be a big deal yeah. With all these good horses around you, and you say you've been lucky, and, and I'm sure there's some luck involved, but you've also had to have the ability to get them to find their best and, and pick the right races for them. Is the pressure for Nathan Williamson to, to leave Southland? Um, do, you, do you feel that? Is it, is it part of your mindset? Yeah, there's been, I've, I've thought about it a lot. Um, obviously now it's not just me. We've got, I've got a family and everything as well, and. Um, my wife Katie's got a super job um, where she is and um, she's deputy principal of the local school here so that's that's a, a bit of a factor to say at the at the moment we'll be staying put but it has been definite thoughts of it and um, it is somewhere probably that um, you know if depending on how things go um, whether you know um, we stay here for good or whether we do make the move up the country I'm certainly um, you know, not sort of um, ruling it out, that's for sure. But um, at this stage, I think the South and Racing, what we're doing is really good. And, um, you know, I've got, obviously, a um, great mate in Regan Todd up the road that I can call on to look after. That's working in and, really well for you, isn't oh, it? Oh, it's super. Like, um, Reg, is, as you know, he's just a champion and um, he's always, you know, puts two or three lengths on my horses when they're there. He's that good. So I, uh, <laughs> yeah, but we, we oh, I love going up there and staying and, and, you know, we sort of, the horses love it too. It's their home away from home and, um, and you yeah, know, vice versa. He's, he comes down here and stays too. So that's worked out super. It's been a great relationship like that and um, hopefully we can continue to just keep doing that. You've dipped your toe in the water administration-wise too. You, you're happy to be involved in the programming and, and, and trying to make the industry a better, better code? Yeah, yeah, I have. Um, it's sort of, you know, um, something that, um, I, yeah, I mean, we're passionate about the game and I want to see it keep going ahead and, and want to help try and do that. And, um, 
you know, so yeah, I've been on the programming committee now and been involved with the Invercargill Trotting Club for um, quite a few years now. So um, yeah, something that I enjoy doing. Um, obviously, um, you've got to mix all this in with family time and training horses and driving horses and everything like that. But it's um, yeah, it's it's just something that I'm really um, hope, hopeful that Southland can continue to grow because um, we've made some good steps these last few years. The sun's going down here. It's getting rather cool in the middle of June. <laughs> The sun's not going down on your career though, Nathan. Um, gee, it's been great to catch up and, and reminisce about already in your short training career, some of the smarty you've had, and there's a lot to look forward to, isn't there? Yeah, oh, I hope so, Greg. Um, look, we're pretty, you know, pretty excited about the future and what it may hold, and um, yeah, just hopefully we can find those, a few more of those really good authors, you know, it'd be great.